The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and thanks for attending today's Coffee with Kalefi webinar. This is Kevin Freet, uh, located here at the Kalefi North America headquarters in beautiful Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And today, we're honored to have a very special guest speaker, uh, Julius Belanco. Uh, Julius is a graduate of Stevens Institute of Technology. He's a registered professional engineer and a licensed master plumber as well. He is president of JB Engineering and Code Consulting PC, and his firm specializes in codes and standards consulting in the areas of plumbing, mechanical, life safety, and fire protection engineering. Julius is a well-known lecturer and a monthly columnist in both plumbing and mechanical and PM Engineer magazines. So welcome, Julius. Well, thank you, and uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Today I get to speak on one of my favorite subject matters, which is pressure reducing valves. I've always been fascinated by the use of these valves. Um, they're kind of a simple valve. I, I'm always asked how do they work and, and what are they doing. It's just a easy way for us to control the pressure in, a, uh, in this particular case of plumbing system. Uh, and I've been often accused of saying the valve is a, a, a dumb valve or a stupid valve. Um, actually, they're, they're very smart when we design them correctly and set them up properly, but in the way they're dumb, they will do whatever you tell them to do. They are designed to control the pressure. Um, so let's go into first how they work. They're nothing more than, in a way, a glorified check valve that's got a tension on the end where we need to apply that pressure to open the orifice and let the water flow. And in doing so, we are lowering the pressure. Um, I had a college professor that, in, of fluid dynamics that always said, when you're confused in fluid, switch media. So instead of talking about water, what we're doing now, let's talk about air. I um, am in the air quite a bit flying around this great country of ours. And when I hop on a plane in Chicago and, and go to New York, the pilot gets on and says, we have a good tailwind, and we'll get to New York in an hour and 20 minutes. So when I turn around to come back home, I hop in uh, the plane, and the pilot gets on and says, well, we have a tremendous headwind, and it takes an hour and 40 minutes. Well, the plane is going the same speed. Um, that's the pressure. And what's happening is that headwind is now slowing the plane down. So it takes all of a sudden 20 minutes longer to get home. That's what's happening with our PRV is we are putting a headwind in and slowing down that pressure. So if we take a look at it, let's do an inlet pressure of, of 150 PSI. So that pressure is coming in. Now I've got a spring and a diaphragm that's working on that orifice and that is holding the orifice closed. But the um, pressure is going to want to open it up. And the, the tension that I'm putting on it is 70 PSI to open that up. So I'm, I'm exerting, I'm using 70 PSI of energy. You know, pressure is energy. So to open it. And in the end result, I take 50, 150 minus 70, I end up with 80 PSI. So on, on the outlet of my PRV is 80 PSI. So that's the simple, basic way of how our PRV is going to operate. It's just, uh, I li like to look at it as an energy conversion. Our energy is 150 PSI. It takes a 70 PSI of energy to open the valve, and it's, as a result, I'm only left with 80 PSI. And that's how these valves are going to operate. That's how they function. Of course, we have to keep in mind that it is a valve, and the more flow we put through it, the more restriction we have, and we have a CV factor and we're going to talk about later on, and that CV factor is going to also change our pressure dynamics, so we can't forget that aspect. So we have two aspects of the valve. One is the opening and closing, which is steel under pressure. The other is the movement of flow through the orifice, and that's going to steal pressure. So let's make sure we remember both of those. The mistake I find both from my engineering colleagues and my contractor friends are, uh, they forget about the second factor, the CV, um, and they just think this valve is stupid, and if I set it and it's going to go to 80 PSI, it'll always be 80 PSI. When I run a lot of water through there, the pressure is going to drop below my 80 PSI. Keep that in mind. We'll talk about that in, in just a bit. 
Uh, let's look at this um, also. We get into a larger valve, and I, I threw a simple diagram. This is nothing more than diagrammatic, where I throw a pilot line in. And you can have a pilot line on the inlet pressure going up to the upper chamber of the diaphragm, and you can have a pilot line on the downstream pressure that goes into the upper chamber of the diaphragm. Um, there are going to be controls on those pilot lines. Now, basically, in simple terms, what the pilot lines are designed to do is to offer better and smoother controls to the PRV. So the pressure reducing valve um, tends to want to open up and then close. And what a pilot line is going to do is going to slow the opening, it's going to slow the closing, it's going to fine tune the setting of the PRV. So you, you get into a large valve, pilot lines to many of us in the engineering profession are a must. You, you technically don't need them, but they do allow the valve to operate smoother and better and perform much better uh, in the field. So start to think in terms when you, you're getting up, I always say once you're getting up over you know, two inch, you, you could have a pilot line at two inch, but once you're getting over that, um, I like to have pilot lines and a better control of my PRV. So let's take a look at all the different types. Um, we're showing some of the different uh, products you have out on the marketplace. Uh, the smaller valves right there in the middle is my big guy. And you notice I've got a pilot line on the inlet and a pilot line on the outlet of that particular valve. And that's going to give me the control. And in the middle of the pilot lines, of course, is going to be a PRV, a pressure reducing valve. And that's how I am going to set the valve up. So um, a lot of fine tuning goes in. I, I always tell contractors, you're, you're worth your weight in salt if you can fine tune these um, and set up the pilot lines properly. Um, nowadays, I find a lot of contractors on large um, high-rise buildings are s turning this all over uh, to a balancing contractor, and that's fine. Um, you know, whether you do it or a balancing contractor, make sure they're set up properly once they're installed. Let's look at the sizing and selecting of a PRV. Um, when we get into it, there are certain factors that must be considered, and some of these are often overlooked, and I want to make sure we cover them all. First of all, we have to look at the maximum inlet pressure. Um, I had a project that I went into, and they, they were trying to lower uh, the pressure down from 300 PSI um, to a lower pressure, say 150 PSI. And they put a valve in, and that valve, when you read the literature, said its maximum pressure was 150 PSI, and it lowered to the lowest pressure was 30. Well, that was the wrong valve to select. So we have to look at what is the maximum inlet pressure that the valve is set up for. And then next is what is the minimum outlet pressure. Sometimes a valve won't go down to the pressure rating that I want. I was dealing with one valve that contractor installed. I pulled out the manual, and all of a sudden it said, the lowest outlet pressure was 75 PSI. We were trying to get it to 60. Well, you're never going to do that. So um, again, we've got to look at those factors in our design before we install the valve. Next thing we get into is the maximum flow rate. Um, the maximum flow rate is going to be uh, what that valve's maximum capabilities are. Most valve manufacturers are also going to tell you what they consider to be the sweet spot or the range that they want you to design your system for in the maximum flow rate. Now, the valves will go above that, but when you go above the sweet spot, you start to lose more pressure during that particular flow, and it becomes uh, a more erratic pressure in the piping system. So you, you try and look, and we'll talk about the sweet spot in a second. The other one you get into is the minimum flow rate. Uh, this is an often overlooked area. It's often overlooked by my engineering colleagues, and it's often misunderstood by some of my uh, plumbing colleagues uh, and my contractors. They, they tend to think, well, you know, I got the valve in. Well, it'll, it'll operate at anything. And I, I mentioned that in the middle of the night, if I'm in a multi-story building and somebody gets up at 3 a.m. and flushes a water closet, well, that's only going to use 1.6 gallons and it fills in 35 to 40 seconds, so we're looking at a 2 GPM flow rate, and you've got these large valves, they don't want to open for just 2 GPM, so we're, we're going to have to look at 
what the minimum flow rate is. And then finally, another important factor is the maximum temperature. Um, a lot of times we have contractors that think, I'm just going to put one of these at the start of the building. Well, I'm putting them throughout the building, and if I'm dealing on a hot water piping system, it better be rated for the temperature of my hot water. Some valves are rated to only 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Others are rated to 180. Some go over 200 um, degrees Fahrenheit. So you've got to know what you're dealing with. Uh, if we get into a commercial kitchen area, I'm typically running 180 degree hot water. If I get into a residential commercial type building, I'm typically never running over 140. So uh, I have to look at these factors. And then finally, the two warnings that I throw out there. Uh, one we've just been talking about, don't forget the minimum flow rate. That is as important as the maximum flow rate. Don't ignore it. Uh, look at what the manufacturers identify as the minimum flow rate, and don't try and set up a system that goes below that. What that means is uh, sometimes we're going to put in multiple valves to supply the same system. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then finally, don't forget about the valve CV. Now, a lot of manufacturers are not going to give you the CV directly. Some do. I, I prefer to use the chart, and we'll show you how to use the chart in just a second here. So the, the CV is means that the more I flow through that valve, the more pressure I lose. So even though I have it set at one pressure, I'm going to get a lower pressure when I'm flowing that amount of water. Um, let's look at what we get in on the specification sheet for manufacturer. Every manu manufacturer is going to give you a specification sheet. I stole a Kalefi one here. Um, and in this particular one, uh, the information you're going to look at, let me blow it up for you. Is first of all, it's saying this PRV is suitable for water. Now we're going to talk more about what's required to get that certification in a bit. And then you see the maximum working pressure for this particular valve is 300 PSI. So I can handle some high pressures. The downstream pressure settings, it will only range it from 15 to 90. So if I've got to go 150, this is the wrong valve. I'm not going to select it. And I'm often asked, why would I only go down to 150? I might be using it for industrial applications. Uh, you know, I got a potable water supply to an industrial process, or I might go to a piece of equipment, um, or maybe to a lawn sprinkler system, something to that extent. So we, we've got to know what our ranges are. And this one is typically in the plumbing ranges. This, these are ranges for plumbing fixtures. And then the factory setting. This one coming out of factory is set for 45 psi. Now you, you're can set it in the field to anywhere from 15 to 90, but the factory setting is going to come at 45. Um, then finally, the maximum working temperature, you notice this one is good to 180 degrees Fahrenheit. And then finally, if you notice, this one had a uh, pressure gauge installed directly on the valve, and that pressure gauge reads from 0 to 100 PSI. Um, now let's go into the chart that the um, again, for this particular valve that the manufacturer provides for sizing. It's a real simple chart, and if you see that blue area, that blue area is what the manufacturer identifies as the recommended, or what we engineers call the sweet spot. That is the range that this valve prefers to operate in. So if you're looking at the peak demand, the, the typical maximum flow rate, we want to be in this blue range. Now you'll notice for this particular one, I took um, a system that is flowing under peak demand 8 GPM. Uh, you go up from the 8 and you follow it up to the line and you get into that sweet spot for a 3 quarter inch valve and you come over and you see that the velocity is running you know, just under uh, 4 feet per second. Uh, so this particular valve, the 3 quarter, is the ideal one for the AGPM. Now, interesting, if, if I'm going to run, let's say, 20. Now, who, who in their right mind puts 20 GPM through a three-quarter inch line? Well, let's just say you did. You could bring this up, and that valve will still operate. You know, you're going to have some high velocities through there, which means we're going to have higher pressure losses through there. But the valve will still perform. So what we're looking at, really, is the, the sweet spot um, in these particular valves. Uh, this 
chart that we're looking at right now is not going to show us the the low end. Remember the low end I said you it only can flow a certain um, velocity. That's going to be our next chart we'll, we'll take a look at. But So this one is showing you is how, co how can we size based on our flow rate and getting into that sweet spot. Well, let's go to our next nomograph and on this particular nomograph this is showing you the fall off pressure. This is taking the CV for the valve, you know, which is our, our constant factor for the orifice going through the valve. And it's looking at the flow rate. And you know, all my engineering colleagues remember that the CV and the pressure drop is related to the square of the um, flow rate and the square of the CV. So um, that's how we get our, our pressure fall off. Um, and in this particular valve, uh, oh, I said the square of the CV. I meant the square of the uh, flow rate. My apologies. Um, so in this particular valve, we took um, in the AGPM for the three-quarter inch. Um, and if we run up from eight, hit our three-quarter inch valve, you see our three-quarter inch coming down here on the curve. It says, I have an additional pressure loss of 7.3 PSI. So let's say I left that valve at the factory setting of 45 PSI. Um, if I'm flowing 8 GPM, I'm not getting 45 PSI downstream. I'm getting 45 PSI minus my 7.3. So I'm, I'm really down around, uh, let me see if I do my math quickly, like 37.7, did I do it right? Somewhere in that range, um, PSI. So I, if I'm looking for 45 PSI, at that flow rate, I'm going to have to increase the pressure setting of the valve to accommodate that. So that's part of the setup. This is, this is a mistake made by both engineers and contractors in the field, where they think once they set the valve that that's where it's going to be all the time, and that's not true. Um, so really what I have to do is I have to set the valve and account for the pressure that I'm going to lose going through the orifice of that valve. And I've got to take that into consideration when I'm adjusting my system before I, you know, during the commissioning process. So just keep that in mind. Now, what you don't see, this particular nomograph is only going up to an inch and quarter valve. Um, most valves, inch and a quarter, sometimes up to as much as inch and a half, you can go down to a pressure or a flow rate, I should say, of like zero, just above zero. In other words, the valve's going to operate. It'll open. It doesn't have a problem. If we had a two-inch valve, it might come down to this point where it's like 20 GPM, and the line might end there, so that it'll run up here. And of course, you know, we'd have to change the scale to see how much um, more flow rate we get with that valve. But uh, and I, I just made up the 20. I'm just giving you a number as an example. But let's say that two-inch valve says uh, I'm in a range from 20 GPM to X GPM. Well, that means if if I'm less than 20, I've got to do something. So that's where we start to put in two valves in parallel, and we'll talk about that in, in a little bit. But just realize that's where. I'm looking at the larger valves. When I get into a larger valve, they're not going to operate all the way down to zero um, PSI or zero GPM. Um, what you want to do with the valve is I, I always say if you don't design the system correctly, the valve starts to fight. It wants to open. It can't open. It wants to open. It can't open. It. And it's it, when you're fighting, you're slamming that valve. You're pounding it. And you're beating the living daylights out of it. And that's going to cause a premature failure of the valve. So that's, that's what we want to avoid. So we're always going to look to try and get the valve into the sweet spot and out of the low end range where the valve is going to operate on the low end. So uh, just recall that when we're looking at the overall design when we get into these factors. Julius, um, yeah. this is Mark. I'm going to interrupt with a question. Uh, we sure. just had one come in uh, related to this. Um, is this um, a good point to make that it's dangerous to size a pressure reducing valve based on line size? It, it, it actually is. Um, and when we were going over this, I mentioned that. But um, the one thing that the mistake that's often made is engineers will say, well, I've got a two-inch line, so I'll put in a two-inch PRV. 
maybe, maybe not. Maybe I need a two and a half. Maybe I need an inch and a half on that particular line. So I have to look at what the performance is of the valve and what I'm trying to accomplish. So the common mistake made is I've got this pipe size, therefore it equates to this valve size. Don't fall into that trap. Look at the performance of the valve. Look at the design of the system and what the flow rate is. And also look at the pressure fall off. Try to be in the sweet spot under the peak demand and make sure you meet the low end factor so that at a very minimal use of water, the valve will operate. Or the valves, when we're talking multiple valves. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Thank you. Um, let's go into this two-valve concept, what we call the high-low. The high-low is for when we have larger flow conditions and normally larger pipe size. I mentioned typically larger than inch and a half, two inch in size. All right, so for these higher flow installations, we're going to put in two or maybe three PRVs that are going to be installed in parallel. Um, I happen to be one that likes, as an engineer, I like designing with two. I was just on a project out on the West Coast where they used three PRVs. Nothing wrong with it. That was just the control that that engineer looked for. He was trying to get into three different uh, sweet spots and also provide for a very low flow condition. Again, somebody getting up in a, a dwelling unit in the middle of the night, 3 a.m., and flushing the water closet, maybe turning on the lavatory to wash their hands. Um, so that's why they went with the, with the three. Um, as you can imagine, if it's three, it's normally a residential building. Um, commercial buildings, I will typically always get away with two. Um, but th again, that's me. I'm not going to say any engineer is wrong for designing three or any contractor. It's just try and get within the, those design features. Now the smaller valve is always going to handle that low flow condition when the water use is minimal. And as soon as it gets up above the sweet spot for the low valve, we want the larger valve to take over. Um, and then that larger valve is going to handle the peak demand and not that high flow rate condition. All right? And normally the low valve is not going to be doing much of anything at all. Now, when setting these up, the mistake contractors and engineers will often make is they'll, you know, say to set the valves when they're in parallel like this, to set them at the same pressure setting. Well, that's not going to work because now the valves are fighting with one another. Typically, what we will do is take the smaller valve and set that for a higher pressure. That way, it's going to open up first, and it's also going to close last. Think in, in those terms. All right, so in other words, if we set the valve higher, let's say we set it at 80 PSI, and we set the other one at a lower pressure, when the pressure on the downstream side lowers because somebody opens a fixture, what's going to open up first? The one that's set higher. It's going to want to start sending flow. So this, the small valve is going to open up. And then as the flow increases, the large valve opens up. I'm often asked what pressure differential do I do. The smallest pressure differential I've ever done in a system has been 3 PSI, but I'm normally more in the range of 5 and sometimes as much as 7 PSI. I have seen colleagues do 10 PSI in the drop, and that's just the way they have designed their system, and, and that's fine. And you're going to say, why would they be at such a high pressure drop? Remember that CV factor? They're looking at the CV factor to try and um, get between the high flow rates in the small valve to the low flow rates in the big valve. So you, you've got to do that comparison. So that's all, you know, the, the pressure setting is all going to be part of your design where you're looking at the valve, you're looking at the features of the valve, what is the minimum flow rate that you want out of the valve, what is the maximum flow rate I get out of the valve, and also what is the pressure drop off in the valve. So those are all the features what, that we look at in trying to design uh, the set points for the difference between these high-low concepts. So when we get into larger commercial buildings, larger residential buildings, high-rise buildings, I'm going to always be running a high-low concept uh, for the larger piping systems. Let's look at the certification requirements for the valve. 
Now, we already said that we're talking plumbing today, which is potable water and which is drinking water. Um, based on federal law in the U.S., we must be lead free, or that's called low lead. Uh, you know, just so you know, there is this minute amount of lead that can be in the uh, in the brass. But um, so basically, all these valves are going to be lead free. The same is going to be true up in Canada. We're looking at lead free in Canada as well. Um, again, lead free, no lead, low lead, whatever you want to call it. Um, the valves, because they're dealing with drinking water and potable water, must be certified to NSF 61. Now, I list NSF 372. 372 is just that no lead, low lead standard. The interesting thing is a valve says it complies with NSF 61. It also complies with 372 because when you go into the middle of NSF 61, it says for drinking water applications, the following must comply with, also comply with NSF 372. So if a manufacturer is just listing NSF 61, they also comply with 372. I can assure you of that. That's just how the listing process works. Now, a lot of manufacturers are promoting the living daylights of the fact that they also comply with 372, and that's fine. Um, they do. Uh, next, we get into the performance requirements. Those are identified in ASSE uh, 1003 or 1003, depending on what you want to call it. Um, that's referenced in, in the U.S. plumbing codes. We get up into Canada, the performance requirements are identified in being in CSA uh, B356. Um, by the way, the Canadian standards are also recognized in the U.S., uh, so we, we have this harmonization that goes on between the two countries. And then finally, all the plumbing codes require these to be listed by a third-party agency. Uh, your testing laboratories. Um, you'll see the picture I put on here is courtesy of my friends at IATMO R&T Labs. Um, if you're ever in the Ontario, California area, give them a call. They'd love to give you a tour of their labs. Um, I've taken a tour of their labs. Fascinating. Um, not to disparage any of the other listing agencies, I've, I've also taken tours of UL's labs, which are fascinating. They, they'd be happy to give you tours if you contact them ahead of time. And the QAI, I've been tours of that, and a number of other labs as well. So always fascinating to see how they're testing our plumbing products and what they're doing uh, to keep us safe and uh, make sure the products are quality. Hey, Let's Julie, look this at is Kevin. Uh, a quick question on that one. Yeah, let me go um, back. Uh, I noticed that some of the valve specifications say NSF 372, but they, they don't say anything about NSF 61 in their literature. Does that, if you have NSF 372, that doesn't automatically mean you have NSF 61, right? It's a different that, test. That is correct. Um, it, the, the difference between those two, and let me, let me give you a quick overview why some manufacturers might do that. There will be some pressure reducing valves that are going to be used on systems that do not supply drinking water. Now that might sound strange. What, what do you mean potable water not supplying drinking water? Uh, let's say I have a line that's supplying nothing but showers and bathtubs. I can put in a 372 valve, which is required to be lead free by the federal government, um, and then I don't have any drinking water coming out of those outlets. So the plumbing codes actually don't require 61 compliance, but if you have any drinking water going through the valve, it must comply with 61. So, you know, I, I try and convince well manufacturers that 61 is the way to go, uh, and that's the way they do it. But some are looking for special PRVs that are only going to equipment or system, uh, and they're not for drinking water applications. But, again, for you contractors in the field, don't confuse them. Don't get them screwed up because uh, if it's serving or providing any drinking water whatsoever, um, you must comply with NSF 61. Okay, right. thanks. All right, let's look at some of the installation recommendations. You're going to find plumbing codes do different things. Uh, they all have um, slightly different requirements. Um, some of them say for a PRV you have to put a filter or a strain or upstream of a PRV. I happen to be a big fan of this requirement. I, I like doing that all the time. I was in, in the past year or two, I was out on a project and there was a 12-inch PRV, and we were we had um, I was actually out new building in 
we had some water damage and the water damage amounted to over a million dollars. When we took this PRV out, inside the PRV, this 12 inch PRV was a rock that was about six inches long and about three inches in diameter wedged into the orifice of the PRV, which meant it wasn't reducing any pressure whatsoever. Now, the first thing you're going to say, what the heck is a rock that size doing in a, in a water line? Well, uh, somebody fouled up when they were putting the water line in and, and the rock got there. So if there had been a strainer upstream, um, you know, the rock would have been caught in that strainer. But that just gives you an idea. And by the way, the, the pressure coming through that was 300 uh, plus PSI. So now you know why there was so much water damage in the building. Um, the other thing you're going to find is some codes are going to call for a pressure relief valve downstream of a PRB. Now, I'm not uh, a fan of doing this unless there is a sensitive piece of equipment. I remember one project when I was a young engineer and this piece of equipment in an industrial building could only take a maximum of X PSI. Well, if I put a PRV in and it fails um, and the pressure increases, it can damage a multi-thousand dollar piece of equipment. So I'm going to put in some form of protection and a relief valve is one way to do it. Now, I happen to like other valves as well that actually, you know, uh, some, some are called altitude, some are, they're called all different names, but what the valve will do is when you get high pressure, it actually closes off. So it shuts the system down. So you can do it uh, that way as well. So I, I just caution my engineering colleagues out there, if you have something sensitive and you have a PRV, you want an additional safety uh, provision downstream of it in the event that the PRV does fail. Uh, then we get into uh, some of the codes call for an expansion tank downstream of the PRV. The expansion tank is actually intended to handle thermal expansion. When we start to heat water, we get into our thermal expansion. So this is one way of combating the thermal expansion is to use uh, an expansion tank. Of course, there's other design features that my engineering colleagues know that can be done for this, but that is just one option. And then you get into some codes will call for a water hammer arrestor, either upstream or downstream or both. You know, again, sometimes a, a PRV opens and closes very quickly. Some of them have slow opening, slow closing features, so it depends on what you're dealing with. But if you, if you do have a, a quick closing one, you, you do want to provide um, some form of protection from water hammer or hydraulic shock. Now this drawing that I have here shown on the screen, uh, this I stole from Kalepian, uh, one of their specification sheets. I happen to like it because it shows what I like, which are the two shutoff valves. Now I happen to be a big fan of ball valves and I like to use ball valves a lot. You could use gate valve or butterfly valve. In other words, you want a full open valve. But this will allow the PRV to be isolated. Uh, most plumbing codes don't call for this, but every engineer and every contractor who has ever worked on these in the field or dealt in uh, design of some high-end systems knows that this is a proper way to install them because it allows you to now isolate the PRV and to service it, maintain it, replace it, repair it, whatever it might be. You know, without that, it, you, you might be shutting down the whole system. So it's a whole lot easier, you know, if you have isolation valves on either side of a PRV. I think that's a good design feature um, for any engineer to include. And for contractors, I think it's a good installation feature. Uh, you'll also see that there's a filter or strainer. I happen to be a big fan of putting that in. Um, the water hammer arrestor, this one, you look at it and it's on the upstream side. A lot of people say, well, it's on the wrong side of the uh, PRV. You know, if it's trying to handle hydraulic shock, it should be uh, upstream of it, not downstream of it. Actually, the, the reason for this being on the upstream side, I mean on the downstream side, excuse me, is because it, uh, the water hammer arrestor can also address the situation when this valve opens up. When it starts to gradually open, we have that heat of vaporization of water, and all of a sudden you get this clogging noise or glunk, you know. And what's happening is it's the valve attempting to open, and the little air pockets that are heating up and vaporizing. Um, and what the water hammer arrestor does is it actually calms down that noise as well and softens 
that approach. So it's interesting. Some people call that reverse water hammer. I, I don't like that terminology. Um, but in any event, the water hammer restor will help. So, you know, sometimes when we talk about upstream and downstream, one is handling one situation, the other is handling the other situation, which is the hydraulic shock would be upstream, uh, the heat of vaporization would be downstream. Um, the other thing I always like to say is provide plenty of room to service or maintain these valves. Um, this is a mistake that is often made. I, you know, it, being an engineer, the, the one thing we always ask architects for more uh, space or more room, and the answer is constantly no, you can't have it. <laughs> but I've, I've worked with my architect colleagues and, and gotten um, space and made them understand the need to put in uh, room for PRV. I, in, when I'm in certain buildings, I will put them in a closet off the corridor. If I can get them into an equipment room, I'll put them in an equipment room. So I just want to make sure that they are available to be able to service and maintain them. I just got back from a project where I saw nine PRVs in this closet off the Carter. And when I looked at the ones in the back, I asked the contractor, I said, how are you going to service that one? And I go, I don't know. <laughs> well, they were stacked to the point that they were one in front of the other. And there's no way you could have gotten to the one in the back. I was like, oops. Um, not a good way to do it. So keep in mind that these are going to require maintenance. Uh, the other thing I always point out that the PRVs can be noisy, so consider that when locating it. I had one high-rise building that was 60 plus stories in the Chicago area, and the PRVs happened to be installed in the master bedroom in the ceiling, and they actually ended up being right over the bed for the master bedroom. Uh, and the people were being awakened in the middle of the night hearing them clicking and making noise. Well, they do make noise. So um, that's not a good location to put them. I would never put them in a bedroom or over a bedroom. All right, let's look at the maintenance that we've been talking about and what's what's required. Keep in mind these are active valves. That's why they make the noise. They're, they're moving. They're constantly going. Um, that means the moving parts can wear out. So when you get into a PRV, I always say when you get into routine maintenance, the larger the valve, the more maintenance is required. Smaller valves, yeah, you don't need as much maintenance. You, know, you get into a half, three quarter, one inch valve, residential valve, they're normally going to hold up for a long period of time without much maintenance. But you get into a big one and we're going to have some problems. The common failures that we get in, in PRVs is probably the number one is the diaphragm failing. Um, that's, you know, now the valve is not going to be able to set, be set properly. It's not going to perform. So um, that's the number one failure that I typically see. The, the number two is um, threading of the seat. Um, some call it wire drying. There's all kinds of terms. Basically, it looks like somebody ran a thread through it. And what that typically means is that the system was not properly designed. The mistake I've seen contractors do is they find a valve like that and they just replace it with a like valve. I go, you're going to have the same problem. Don't do it. Look at the system. Bring in an engineer if you're not sure. Have them evaluate the design because it means that the valve is, is fighting and it's trying to open, it's closing, it's, and it, there's this war that's going on inside the valve. What also happens is it leads to erosion, corrosion, sometimes downstream on the outlet side of the valve. So you start to see all this erosion, corrosion on the inside. Somebody did not get the design correctly. Um, so that needs a reevaluation to make sure that the valve is properly, uh, the system is properly designed. Quite often, it also means there's not a high-low situation or the high-low is not properly set up. The other thing we run into quite often on the large valves is I will find pilot lines that become blocked because of the water quality. You realize there's not a high movement of water in there. It's more pressure. So um, it's sitting stagnant. And if the water's got a lot of dissolved solids in it, they become blocked. Strainers and filters become blocked. They also become blocked. There are strainers on pilot lines. They become blocked. And then finally, you get into springs losing their tension. When we get into the maintenance schedule, I would say the maintenance schedule is very dependent on uh, the use of the system. If, if I'm in a high-rise building, these are used 
all the time, and they're constantly being, I, I always say abused, they're, they're constantly opening, closing, doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, you get into the next thing is the quality of the water. I'm going to throw this out to my plumbing contractor's friends. You normally know what the quality of the water is in your area. Um, does it have um, high to total dissolved solids? Are they high? Is the hardness um, very high? You know, do you have very hard water? Do you have corrosive water? Uh, we get into some waters and we know they're highly corrosive. Um, and then finally on the maintenance schedule, we look at the size. The larger the valve, the more often I'm going to have to maintain it. The smaller the valve, the, the less I maintain it. Now, I, I happen to live in the Chicago metropolitan area and I've dealt with a lot of high-rise buildings in the Chicago area. Now, Chicago, we take the water right out of Lake Michigan. It's actually very good quality water. It's treated well. It's not high in corrosivity. Um, we don't have to worry that much about hardness. And typically, uh, I will extend a, a maintenance schedule on a large valve and tell them when they first install it, to look at it after three years and then recondition it after five. That's typically what we can get away with in the Chicago area. Some of my colleagues will go seven years in the Chicago area. Um, again, we're talking on large valves. Uh, I normally tell them to at least inspect the valve on an annual basis and take a look and see if everything's uh, functioning or operating correctly, um, and then typically rebuild the valve maybe every five years. Um, you get into a small valve, a residential valve, let's say a three-quarter inch valve. They might last for 10 or 15 years without any maintenance at all. Um, if you get poor water quality, you might be having to service them on an annual basis. You know, It, it really depends on what is the water quality. I, I mean, I've, I've seen some waters that are so poor that these things are gunked up in no time at all. So now they're going to be, you're going to need to service and maintain them. All right. So just keep that in mind. A lot of it depends on what is going on. But don't the, the biggest mistake I find from both the engineering profession and the contractor profession is they think they put this valve in, they walk away, and they don't ever have to look at it again. That's the biggest mistake you make. Julius, this might be a, a good uh, place for a question uh, yeah. that came in relative to maintenance and servicing. Um, in most um, PRV applications, are there common symptoms that you would experience in a facility that would indicate that the pressure reducing valve needs either servicing or replacement? I, I wish there were um, nice features that told you, you know, it, it'd be nice if there was an alarm that went off and said, service, 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 you know, but it doesn't. Typically what starts to happen is the valve gets noisier. And you're going to say, why does it get noisier? Is it may not have, it, it, remember these pilot lines, if they become blocked or partially blocked, they're not going to do the slow open and slow closing feature. They're not going to set it correctly. Um, so that's going to be an indication. So a noisy valve is, is an indication, noisier than normal. Because <laughs> keep in mind, these valves are already noisy to begin with. And, and I don't mean real noisy. They, they just, they will make noise. Um, the other thing that we will see is the change in the pressure settings. If the pressure all of a sudden is rising, that means something is going on in there. If the pressure is lowering and not coming up to the pressure, that means something's going on. Uh, something's getting blocked. Something's getting fouled. And, of course, if the pressure increases tremendously, the diaphragm just fell. So is this... Um uh, a number of manufacturers will, like Kalefi offers the uh, pressure reduce. Oh, I'm sorry, the pressure gauge as an option. Is this a, a situation where that would be handy to to kind of monitor any increase in pressure on the system side? Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of always putting in pressure gauges both uh, before and after the uh, PRV. Um, they're they're not required, you know, but it makes life easy. The only thing I caution people with is. Sometimes the pressure gauge fails before the valve does, so, so you you got to make sure that the pressure gauge is reading correctly. But the beauty is when we talk about that annually inspect, one of the things I do in inspecting is I check the pressure. We have, I was at one building, and they require the maintenance people to go around and once a week um, record the pressure on all the PRV stations. And not a bad idea. It gives them an idea as to how things are working and how they're functioning. All right.
Uh, let, let's go on to um, where are these required. The, the interesting thing is technically the plumbing code never requires a PRV. Um, it says that the water pressure is restricted to a maximum 80 PSI. Now that 80 PSI is at the fixture, so at the outlet. It's not in the piping system. Um, couldn't be in the piping system. I have high-rise buildings where I'm, I'm pumping up to you know the top of uh, Willis Tower, which used to be called Sears Tower. You know, so I, I have my water pipe is much higher than 80 psi, but at the fixture itself, at the plumbing fixture, it cannot exceed 80 psi. So when you have street pressure that exceeds 80 psi, the the way to handle that is put in a PRV, put in a pressure reducing valve. Um, I have to live in the flatlands of the Midwest. Um, heck, we're lucky to get 55 PSI in the street, so I never need a PRV for my home. Um, where I grew up in New Jersey, I lived in a rather, you know, we called it mountainous, people in the West Coast call them hills, but it was a hilly area. So I lived in the lower section of town, the downtown area, which was really down in elevation, and in the street, the pressure was 160 PSI. Well, uh, the home I grew up in needed a PRV. Uh, when you went to the other end of town, the pressure in the street was 30 psi, so they didn't need any PRVs there. Sometimes they had to put in a pump to increase the pressure. And then somewhere along in the town was the street pressure was 80 psi, and you know that's that's when from there and uh, at higher elevations didn't need a PRV, and everything else did. Um, the you get into um, certain multi-story buildings, we'll talk about that in a second, where you, you create your own pressure, but let's let's hold off on that. Now, again, keep in mind that this applies to the outlet of the plumbing fixture. So the PRV can be located in any place as long as I'm controlling the pressure at the fixture outlet. Uh, if you look, I'm showing some residential applications. The first one, um, a few of my colleagues up here in the northern climes where I live look at the photograph that's on your the left hand side of your screen and uh, you go oh my god that will freeze <laughs> now this is a place um, you know southern Florida you might go as far north maybe as Orlando maybe a little bit further you know going along the lower coast of the United States across Texas into New Mexico Arizona and Southern California and of course Hawaii you can get away with installations like this but I even say, like, if you go to Alabama, you get into the mountainous area of Alabama, you don't want to put this in because it gets a lot colder up there in, in the mountains than it does in the lower sections. Um, and you'll see that these are residential where they're putting it right at the inlet of the supply to the home, uh, which is fine. You know, that's that's one thing you can do. Uh, it, it'll work well there. Uh, you know, you can locate them any place else as well if you so choose. So the, what we've been looking at is predominantly your single-family dwellings. Uh, typically, one PRV is installed uh, just on the inlet. Uh, typically, it's installed downstream of the water meter. Um, nowadays, we've got a lot of times backflow preventers being required in single-family dwellings, sometimes water meter with built-in backflow preventers. So we, we're not worrying as much. In the good old days, we used to worry about putting in a PRV with a bypass on it, and the bypass would allow the thermal expansion to go through. Now we just treat the thermal expansion, so we don't, don't get too excited about that. Um, when we get into multi-story buildings or high-rise buildings, um, that's where the supply pressure can easily exceed 80 PSI uh, just from the building design itself. So for mo most multi-story, uh, typically high-rise buildings, we're putting in a number of PRVs um, to control the system pressure. That building I told you about in Chicago that was more than 60 stories tall, um, there were over 250 PRVs installed in that particular building. Uh, so there's there's many options for locating the PRVs in the multi-story buildings. And I, and I don't want to go into too long, but I just thought I'd take some stuff that I threw in from my um, uh, high-rise plumbing design seminar that I do. And, you know, most of you know when you raise a column of water one foot, you increase the pressure at the base by 0.433 PSI. So if you're going to assume 80 PSI maximum, and then we always allow for friction loss and some safety factors, we say you can lose 45 PSI in a zone. So when you take that, subtract 80 minus the 45, that 
equates to about 104 feet or approximately an 8 to 10 story um, building per or 8 to 10 stories for a zone. So what we'll end up with is when we have this water supplied, so let's say the water is at the start of the zone, at the bottom is 80 PSI, we'll go up to the top, we'll allow a drop of 45 PSI from elevation change and we know at the fixture we're going to get at least 25 PSI. Again, we have losses in the piping um, as well. Now that 25 PSI, if you're wondering what that is all based on, um, that's the pressure required to operate a compensating shower valve. So that's the pressure we look at in most residential buildings. If you get into commercial building where we're using a flushometer for a water closet or a urinal, um, the majority of them will operate also with 25 PSI. Some claim they can operate as low as 20. Then you get into some of the uh, higher end flush valves that say they need a minimum of 35 PSI. So it's something to consider in the design. You just have to know what pressure you need for what, whatever that particular building is. Um, so we get into when we're over a 10 story building, we'll do the zones and I'm showing here um, a simple um, high rise, I, I don't know how many stories, it might be 16 stories or something like that. So on the lower floors, uh, we're doing an express riser here and what that means is we're pumping the water up from the lowest level and then we're then putting in a PRV and then dropping the pressure and feeding it down. So this is an up feed, down feed type of system. Engineers like doing down feed systems because they feel that they can control the pressure better. Um, there, there's questions to that. I, I happen to like down feed systems myself. That's just me as an engineer. Um, so in this particular situation, the upper floors, of course, we don't need a PRV because we're going to set the pump so that it never exceeds that 80 PSI for the upper floors. And then for the lower floors, we're going to put the PRV in and we're going to set it uh, in this particular case, we'll probably set it for 35 or 40 PSI. Uh, 35 is the typical, and then we'll drop it down. And at the bottom level, it's going to be, um, you know, your 80 PSI. Now, in a situation like this, uh, your minimum number of PRVs per zone are going to be two: one on a hot water, and one on a cold water. You got to remember, you got hot water as well. Um, a better installation, of course, is going to be a minimum of four per zone: two on the hot and two on the cold. Remember, hot's going to have a high end and a low end, so you've got the high-low situation for the flows, and cold is going to have the high and the low as well. So that, that's where your four valves come in, and that's going to be per zone. Now you can see how in a multi-story building, that high-rise building, it's easy to get over 250 PRVs when you're over 60 stories tall. Um, now you could in your design, if you wanted to, put a booster pump in for every zone and that if you look at this particular design, I, I don't need any PRVs in the building because I just set my pump up this way. Um, this is not an intelligent way of doing it. I'd rather put in a pumping package with a, a VFD pumping package and have a single express riser and put in PRVs. Uh, less piping involved, easier pumping package. So. Um, Again, I'm just showing options. I, I don't call this an intelligent option. It's just one that's available. And then, you know, finally, you get into the other type of design we'll see. Um, we, we tend to say that in high-rise um, buildings, the plumbing goes from being piped horizontally to being piped vertically. But some engineers and contractors choose to do the combination vertical and horizontal, and that's what this is showing, where they put in the main run up, and they'll put a few of these and then they'll still pipe horizontally. I'm, I'm not a big fan of this design, but I've seen it done. When you do it this way, they'll put in a PRV on every floor. I was at a building in the Queens, New York, and every dwelling unit in this high-rise building had their own PRV. That's perfectly acceptable. You can do it that way. Um, you'll notice on the upper floors here, there are no PRVs. That's because, again, our pumping package for the upper floors are going to be such that the pump takes care of the pressure differential and we never go above that 80 PSI. Um, and then finally, we're, we're showing uh, the typical zone. This is a two-zone system where, again, I have my, my booster pump package and then I get my lower floors, I go through a PRV and I have a downfeed system. And then on the upper floors, I don't need a PRV because I'm setting my pump to handle the, that upper zone so that I don't need the PRV. Um, the, the interesting thing is when we're doing high-rise design, all we're doing is starting to stack these zones. So 
you know, when you say when the again the tallest building I've been involved in is is been over 60 stories. I haven't done a hundred story um, building, but if you had a hundred stories, you just start stacking zones. That's all you're doing. So you uh, you just put in these multiple BRVs per each zone, and and that's how we handle this situation. If there are any questions, I'll, I'll take them right now. Um, good, good question. I, I do not use them in series. Now, I, I will give one exception to that. Uh, in my youth as an engineer, when I was a young engineer, I did industrial buildings. And there I would do them in series because we would be stepping down. Um, sometimes we'd be going from 300 to 150 down to 60 PSI. Now I would be running them in series because I could control my situation better. But in a, in a potable water system, I normally do not do them in series. And the reason being is if you put them in series, what typically happens with the valves is if you don't set them up correctly, the valves start fighting with each other. And everybody says, what do you mean they're fighting with each other? Well, what's going to happen as soon as I open a fixture downstream, the downstream valve is the first one that has to open. And it, it wants to open, and but it has no flow because the upstream valve is closed. So now the upstream valve has to open. So you see, I, I start this fighting between the two valves. I'm better off with one valve that's going to control that pressure drop. Um, and typically, in when you get into plumbing systems, I'm not in a pressure that demands a two-step down situation. So if I put them in, in series, um, those valves are always fighting with each other. And you will see premature failure of the valve. And you will find that it's going to be extremely difficult to control the pressure. I want to thank Julius again. Uh, that was really, really good, Julius. We learned a lot. And uh, if, there's any, if there's nothing else, uh, thanks, everybody. And uh, send your questions in. We will answer all of them. Have a great afternoon. Thanks for, thanks for attending.